Um, we'll touch on that later in the panel discussion. Um, so now going on to lecture three, which is products to support interoperability. I'd like to invite onto the stage our four speakers. We've gone from three to four. There won't be more. Um, we've got Indy Singh, uh, Head of Architecture from NHS England, Ian Townsend, Phil Stradling and Mike Smith um, to come and speak to us about the products to support interoperability. Indy. Cheers, Mayor. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, first of all, I wanted to congratulate Amir and the uh, organising team. I think it's been a fantastic couple of days in terms of the Interoperability Summit and a whole range of different topics. Uh, what I wanted to really talk about today, and I was really keen that the members of the team um, really present the areas they're working on around actually how we start trying to land this within the service. Um, first of all, and I think today and the last two days have been a really good reflection of this, is we cannot do this through individual single organisations. We have to do this as a collective and a network of networks that brings together CCIO, CIOs, BCS, Interopen, Tech UK and others. So actually this is as much working with frontline organisations and colleagues as well as the vendor community and national organisations all together in one coherent approach. And I think this is something that we have to build on um, have to take the momentum that we have within Interopen and look at how we really try and move this to the next level. What this really does mean then is a responsibility for each of us working together collectively around how we use our respective responsibilities, levers, influence to really try and drive one overall agenda. The other piece that I thought was really important to um, put into context is how fundamental and important the conversations we've had over the last two days are around interoperability in light of really where we're trying to get to overall. So interoperability is fundamental around how we support direct care and how we in enable information to be shared across care settings. But ultimately, that's the first step on a rung of actually how do we start looking to create local learning, health and care systems? How do we start using the information that we get from direct care to then be able to start being much more proactive in how we treat our, ourselves as patients and, and, and uh, and others, but then also to be able to start thinking about how we rearrange our services based upon that information. So part of the work that's, uh, that you may have come across to be merging around something called the target architecture is very much around how do we start enabling local learning, health and care systems? How do we start um, recognising some of the ambitions in the SDPs, which Phil and others will go on to, and really the role of interoperability being fundamental as part of that. And actually what we need to start moving away from is separately thinking about interoperability over here and analytics over here and PHRs and personal health records over here, but actually how do we look at that as a collective uh, and overall approach. In terms of what we're doing then at the moment is, as we said, while we've got the work going on around interoperability, at the same time clearly there's a whole set of planning going on within the service, strategic transformation plans, local digital roadmaps. How do we start embedding this agenda within that and really, how do we start looking at the clinical and the service change ambitions that we're hearing from the service and really start to understand how interoperability can facilitate those? So as a result, what the guys are doing across the regions is working with the regional teams in HS England, understanding the SDPs, understanding what's coming out of the LDR ambitions. And then also at the same time, the opportunity through the global digital exemplars both around understanding what their priorities are, but also, again, how we can work with the vendors who are part of those digital exemplars to be able to really drive the implementation. Because for me, this is all about how do we start being clear on what the business needs are and how do we start driving the implementation. And the other point to highlight to, to, to the audience as well is, in terms of how we start driving this through the service, there are already commitments that we're going to be including within the NHS standard contract that comes in from April around the requirement for organisations to be able to support transfers of care of key pieces of information at handover, be it around discharges, any discharges and outpatient letters, um, which at least gets us to help the service get to a minimum bar of being able to share information uh, across key transitions, those being aligned with the PRSB headings, those based upon structured information. So very much some of the key themes that we've talked about over the last two days, but putting that in a real business context in terms of how we're supporting the front line. 
The other key standard contract commitment at the same time, though, is around the requirement provider systems to share structured content through open interfaces. So again, this is where what we can do as a collective set of organisations is how do we use our levers and our incentives to be able to really drive the interoperability agenda so it's not seen as a separate agenda from a technical perspective, but actually it's fundamentally part of clinical service change. I'm now going to hand over to the rest of the team in terms of the work they've been doing at a local level um, and also some of the key products and outputs that we're trying to work through with Interopen on in terms of developing that can really take a whole of the lot of knowledge that we heard over the last two days, a whole lot of the insight, and actually how do we start landing that within the service. Thank you. <laughs> this is just my slide. And going into that, sorry, this is my last <laughs> slide. Um, one of the key things that the guys have done uh, and leading into the work in regionals is actually start trying to understand where people are at. So this is a picture of where we currently understand progress around information sharing and interoperability. Um, and as you'll see, there's already a significant amount of information sharing going on across different regions. There's already a number of areas that are clearly well ahead who are already thinking about sharing across care settings, how through the appropriate approaches and controls can we then start using that information for subsequent purposes. But the other bit, which isn't on the slide, which I think is really reflective, is out of I think 39 out of the 44 SDP plans, they all explicitly call out for shared care records or local approaches and regional platforms around information sharing. So actually this isn't something that is diametrically against what we're hearing from the service. The role of interoperability, the role around how do we support information sharing across different care settings is fundamentally aligned with what we're hearing in terms of transformation plans. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. And one of the um, areas that was called out in the work to create the target architecture was this uh, consensus. We saw it on the day and we saw it in the feedback uh, around the idea of um, an STP governed platform, a set of shared services that would be uh, of business and, and technical capabilities that an STP, the 44 STPs, uh, might establish to facilitate the information and population he health management purposes that were called out uh, in the target architecture. So what we thought we would do as one of the pieces of work is help try and put some flesh on the bones of this idea uh, that's in the target architecture of an STP governed platform. So I've tried to represent this diagrammatically as a platform with a number of shared services uh, such as information exchange, uh, analytics, a clinical repository. What is the STP? So an STP is um, the Sustainability and Transformation Plan was the, original, was the original definition. And last year there were two initiatives, the STP initiative to create the plans for transformation and the local digital roadmaps, the ODRs. So when we use the phrase STP for today, we mean that combination of leaders that have come together from health, from social care, to form a plan, to add the digital element to that. So we're just using that as shorthand for both the transformation and the digital elements for a collective team to say, in our particular boundary, how do we want to move forward? Now the boundary is a, a semi-permeable boundary, is a boundary to give governance. So we see leaderships uh, across the, uh, the regions happening. So what we're doing is working through the, the regional teams, North East, South East and West, to then reach out to the STP and LDR teams. So for instance, early this week I was down in Somerset. We met with the Somerset STP team. We also had in that meeting a representative from PRSB. And what was interesting was that we could talk about the current work going on around fire profiles, whether it's for the, uh, the GP uh, Connect program or the Child Health program. But equally, what we learned down in Somerset, they were doing some great work uh, that we could feed into PRSB to create some new uh, profiles with respect to uh, risk stratification and, and how they're trying to do uh, uh, that risk stratification process to identify at risk patients in real time at the point of an encounter. So that was one of the learnings and one of the join-ups that we saw by going out regionally. And this is what we're trying to say, is we've got these great uh, pieces of work, the SDPs and the LDRs, to get to, um, to put the flesh on the bones of that. We want to go out to the regions, learn what's happening in terms of best practice, and then create some design guidance, which uh, we'll talk about in a minute. 
So the idea is you've got these shared services, you let every SDP determine what new models of care they want to introduce, so it's choice options uh, to the SDP, whether that's an MCP or a PAX that will work in conjunction with existing providers. And then whether it's for a direct care purpose, population health management purposes or research, we want to enable the SDP to implement that platform uh, in, in the way they choose so that we can share the information for those particular purposes. Multi-specialty practice, the big tent idea. So, so I'm calling out shorthands for sort of things going on. So, for instance, in the Birmingham meeting I was at, um, uh, was it two weeks ago? Uh, Birmingham are saying in their particular SDP they're likely to have different um, accountable care models that would include both. Um, Whereas you go down to Dorset, we've got Andy Hadley here from Dorset, we've got very much a coterminous LDR, SDP, accountable care type thinking. So this is shorthand, um, we're just putting, putting it at the high level, it'll be for you to determine exactly how you want this to land. To give, oops, to give a flavour for, for Michael as we were asked to do, um, we're trying to illustrate here that one of the parts of the story for Michael was Michael has diabetes, he has mental health conditions, so he has med meds prescribed from a, number of, um, from a number of clinicians. So in one particular part of the story, it was Michael's uh, got a text to remind him to attend the appointment with Dr. Lowndes. So what we want to enable is for Dr. Lowndes in real time to consume meds from those APIs that we've all heard about uh, in the previous sessions uh, from those providers so Dr. Lowndes can review the meds, make appropriate decisions, be informed of any alerts and contraindications. So that what we're saying is the SDP, as a leadership team, can think about what are the club rules for adopting standards, for having an information sharing agreement, for having shared services, so that whether it's Dr. Lowndes in Hospital A or any other care setting for a particular clinical scenario can pull in real time the information they need. In this particular example, it's pulling in the meds from a number of other care settings to inform Dr. Lowndes and make a better decision for Michael. One of the other aspects you'd want to say is, well, there's a population of Michaels with these particular conditions, so how do we then bring in the, the research uh, analytics uh, and the learning healthcare aspects? So this is just trying to give an illustration of the work we're doing to put some flesh on the bones of an SDP platform and how it can be used not only to support Michael but a population of Michaels to improve the learning uh, and create new pathways of care that then the leadership team can, can then implement across their patch. So it's very much a distributed and federated model. So we're distributing out the capabilities and making it federated so that it works for the patients. And Mike will talk to some of the patient scenarios. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so we've spoken a lot in, in this conference about collaboration. Um, and it, now, what I want to really talk about now is how do I actually make some of this happen? So we've got this, the top level view, you know, so what do these STPs start looking like? What's the, the big, big capabilities they're putting in place? Um, but generally when I, when I go out and speak to the system, what, what, they're, what, what they're, they're saying is how do, I, how do I solve a specific problem? So I want to sort of take us down a, a couple of levels and start talking about how we might solve specific types of problems. And that's one of the key things that we want to bring out into the design guidance, giving people a sense of how, how you do these, how you can solve individual uh, issues such as uh, meds reconciliation. So the first thing is, one of the key things we need to do is get people onto the same page. So it's really good to have uh, Michael's story, um, that's the same approach we've been taking, looking at um, a, a number of patient stories. Um, so, and we've obviously got a, 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 a number, number here. So th I, can't, I can't explain how useful that is in all the conversations. Whenever, we, when we're, whenever we're speaking to um, clinicians, as soon as we can get on, onto that page around the patient journey, it makes the conversation so much easier. So what are we working on currently? So last year, we, we, out of the CCIO network, we identified some sort of key clinical scenarios. Uh, and the, the driver for that was to understand what, what's the needs for structured information. 
Okay, so the, these these clinical scenarios have been driving quite a lot of work we've been doing. Um, so I'll just pick up on some of the, the things that, that we're seeing. So, um, so if we consider medications, um, the big the big question people are asking me is, you know, how do I do medication reconciliation? Okay, so what we need to do is really we need to understand that obviously that, that space. So I've had re really had the good opportunity, uh, been invited down to um, Warrington, and they've shown me around A and E and showed me well, actually what do we mean by meds reconciliation? What 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 is the actual big problem? So mentally I, I had this view of what I think the problem is. But actually going down, sitting there with a clinician in an A&E ward, where, where they're entering the, the drugs, you really get it. You go, I really understand that problem. It absolutely makes complete sense to me. Your life is a nightmare. Okay? And, but I also then say, but that is, an easy sol that is a really solvable problem. We've got all the technology. We know how to do that. What you're asking for is a list of medications that you can automatically bring in from the patient's uh, various sources and then allow you to review that and then file it. That's it. Really simple, really powerful. I now get it. Um, you, I, you understand I get it. Um, and that's, that's help, that helps move, move us forward. Um, so other areas, so if we consider things like, uh, let's say, pop, you know, so assessments. So we had a scenario coming at CCIO, good use, use case to this uh, is, we want to use it for pre-operative assessments. Okay, so we started considering that, but actually, when I've sp spoke to people like West Yorkshire, what they're saying is our big problem that we want to look at around assessments is looking at uh, patients with serious mental illnesses. Okay, so we want to do a um, a physical ass health assessment, um, same type of thing. Which is basically, we want to do a big structured assessment, share that with the community, uh, in order to make sure. Patients uh, with serious mental illnesses are, are, are given proper regular um, physical assessments. So that's the sort of use case again. We, we, we can look at both those, those assessment um, problems and look at and, and, and try and say, well, is it the same type of problem space? Is there something new to this? Is it, you know, so it gives us a sense to broaden the types of scenarios. That, so we, we can focus and discuss one particular type of assessment problem, but Actually, what's the broad applicability of it? So that's, that's, that's one, one area. Um, other areas around care planning as well. So uh, it's not specifically called out on here, but if we talk about end of life preferences, we're still getting into that space where we're start, start, starting to talk about end of life uh, and crisis care plans and other types of care plans. And uh, that's obviously a huge area, but what, what it allows us to do, again, narrow down on these things, talk it through as patient, patient um, journey. Everybody in that, that conversation, so I'm coming from it from a technical point, so my, my mindset is going to go, okay, what APIs do I need? What information do I need? What's the workflow processes look like? That's completely different, but we're still around the patient journey, so we're talking the same language. Um, moving forward, then, then looking at things like uh, encounter timelines. Um, so, this is brilliant. Um, so, we're, we're talking, you know, we want to see everything that's happened to the patient. But moving forward, what, what, what's the future look like on that, in, in that encounter timeline? So, can we actually predict some of the things that are happening? Well, we can, because we know in some cases we know there's planned activities going on. But could we actually do something around more intelligent um, processing and saying, well, there's a, a, a potential path? Yeah, I don't know. but. It's an interesting area. And again, that links into the broad applicability of how, how, how or the broad problem space, which is um, we, as, as a clinician, we want to understand uh, all the sources of information about a patient, and we need to have a mechanism to help us gather that information and, and, and gain access to it. So, you know, it's this encounter timeline is is basically telling us where all the all our source of information is. It's an index, effectively, um, but but presented in a, a really useful uh, form. Um, so that's just, so that's all all the types of scenarios we're working. The focus on on those scenarios is so when I'm going out, I want to look at a particular example like meds reconciliation, uh, and what I'm doing. So with Warrington, I'm going. Okay, I want to 
articulate that problem in enough detail so that when I walk away, um, I could then give that to a supplier who could build it. Okay, so I'm not doing a use case talking about the clinical, the clinical journey and the benefits and stuff. We get, we get all of that. But what we're actually doing out of that work is a concrete design. That's where we're going to get to. So I'm going to go, I can solve one problem, which I think it would be really useful for people to understand the approach, so broadly useful, but it will actually tell us how to solve a problem, okay, in enough detail that people could actually go and code it. And uh, I think that, that's one of the useful, it's that level of product that we want to get out. It can't be just a use case. It's got to be, I can now deliver this. So that's, that's my, the, my big passion, is let's give, give people something they can actually then actually deliver on. Um, so, stepping back a bit though, so we, when we do this work, we, we, we can't isolate ourselves into one particular use case. So, we've got to keep stepping back and stepping in. So, this is about, we've got the use case, okay, great, let's test it against our business capabilities and the uh, information sharing purposes. Does, does, it all, does, does our thinking actually align up? So, um, keep reflecting um, in all the work you do on the detail, how does it, how can it work with that bigger picture? Do, do these things line up? So the bit around looking at structuring our business capabilities um, and, and saying, well, do, do, you know, where does this fit? That, that's going to help us understand more broadly its broad applicability. Um, OK, so I'm going to just pass on to Ian now, who's going to talk about some of the work he's doing. Thanks, Mike. So this isn't just some of the work I'm doing this is across the team. I feel like I've drawn the short straw because I've got the slides with just bullet points, whereas Mike and Phil have got the exciting stuff with all the pictures. So Phil talked about the design guide um, earlier on, and this is kind of what we're aiming to do with the design guide. So all the things I'm going to talk about are the kind of products that we're trying to create in collaboration that help to move forward various aspects like the target architecture, the transfer of care, the open interfaces. Um, so for the design guide, we're kind of looking at how we evolve the target architecture to kind of make it a bit real, as Phil says, put some flesh on the bones of that. Um, so it's focusing on the idea of a platform of shared services um, within an area, um, which isn't necessarily regional, necessarily just one SCP, but within an area. Um, and that's looking at not just what we think is a good idea now, but what people are doing out there in practice already. So we're looking at best practice from existing local organisations, we're looking at best practice um, that's part of industry already. So the document, um, or the, the target architecture document came out of the summit that was held in November, which had representation from across uh, local providers and from um, industry as well. And this is the next kind of iteration that, that we're moving on with. Um, one of the aims of the design guide is, is to look at how we um, drive partner organisations to get some readiness in the system. So we're, when we come to the point, we're not starting from scratch. Um, when SCPs kind of organise themselves in, into implementing some of these things. Um, so where have we got so far? So Phil's leading a, a set of engagements, so we've got a lot of regional engagement across each of the four NHS England regions, um, as well as some specific areas, um, we can see there. We've got supplier engagement, so we've talked with uh, a range of suppliers through Interopen and individually with, with suppliers who've come forward. Um, as so mentioned, we've got PRSB uh, with the Dorset meeting, so they're, they're keen to get involved in, in this work as well. We're looking at a mix of the capabilities that Mike's just talked about, mixed with the technology that delivers those capabilities as well. So we think we've got a set of business capabilities, but we've also got a set of um, technical capabilities that deliver those business capabilities. Um, and we're looking at kind of uh, within the target architecture, how that, that, that forms a hybrid model um, for everything that we're seeing out there at the moment. Um, so just on the last slide on the design guide, some of the emerging content. So um, We've seen some of the slides kind of that make up some of this content already. So clinical standards are in there. Um, archetypes are in there for the architecture. Use of cloud services, how that um, affects um, what we're going to do forward. Um, and the process that we go through to get to um, the point of this design guide. So I think we see this, this the version that will come out with the design guide in the coming months will be the first version. But actually, you could see that growing as we look across more of the business capabilities that are relevant across more of the STPs. I think what we'll be interested to see is how many STPs, which, which capabilities they start on. So some will be further ad advanced than others, and so they'll be picking up different capabilities. So we need to make sure that the content that we have as we evolve the design guide covers uh, a breadth of those things. 
Um, so the next one we'll talk about is the STP Diagnostic and Classification. So, so I said we've got a set of sustainability transformation plans, of 44 of them. Um, so this commission um, is looking at the moment at how do we create a classification scheme across the STPs, are looking at a range of uh, things across the business capabilities, across their organisational readiness, across their current digital maturity, um, and a range of other factors to kind of come to a, a set of potential classifications and then to take all 44 STPs and to classify them um, into one of the boxes. That's not to say that they'll always be in that box, and it's not to say that the boxes are hierarchical. Actually, they, 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 they're kind of uh, peers to each other. Off the back of that, uh, the production of a kind of handbook. So the handbook will talk about how STPs in each of the different classifications should move forward or could move forward. So it'll talk about things like the relationships you should build, whether it's AHSNs, whether it's with industry, um, and the other activities that they should undertake to try to move along in their own digital uh, maturity. I'm moving on for that one. So. The next one is, is, is the business case. I know we've got the, the business case talk just coming up after this, which uh, you can see. So we have to work out at the moment, which is looking at the development of, of um, a kind of business case guide. So we've got uh, uh, some work that we're doing to determine what or how we support local organisations in bidding um, for, for money, or whether that's from national or whether that's from their own local board. So what, what should be in a business case um, and it'll cover off the five um, layer model from uh, HMT, which the management one is slightly hidden on the slide, uh, but it is there as well. So we're thinking that, that that's going to be how they use to justify investment in information sharing solutions going forward. And there might be um, some templates that would come out of that, at the back of that, or there might be some shared business cases that we organisations begin to contribute um, back after they've kind of used this guidance. So local case studies, so there's lots of case studies out there at the moment. Um, so we've been working with a, with a range of people in HS England, we're working with the, with the vanguards um, on some of the ones that they're working on at the moment, but we've got a set as well that we're looking at to go into a bit more detail. So some of the cases that are out there at the moment are kind of a, a couple of pages, um, but what we want to do uh, with this commission is, is look in a bit more detail at what the business problem that someone was trying to solve, so what, what issues was someone experiencing in an organisation um, and what effect did that have on, on the care that they've been delivering? What technical solution did they put in place in a bit of detail? So uh, actually what systems are in place, what does the architecture look like? Um, what business change did they have to undertake as part of that? Um, and then coming out, see a bit of the solution in action um, and then what benefits that brought to the organisation, how that transformed uh, the care, with some qualitative and quantitative benefits that came out of the back of that. So we've got a couple of a, a, a brief ones. These, these were previous ones that, that we talked about, the kind of two pages that actually we're looking to, to now expand to get a bit more of a view of the architecture. So I won't talk through um, that one in any, any great detail. Uh, and the last slide uh, for me is on the information sharing needs. So. Um, Mike's touched on um, the work we're doing around the, the scenarios, around the patient stories. Um, so we've got the set that you saw on the screen earlier, and then it's Michael's story as well. And actually, we want to ex expand on some of those as well. So we've got uh, some work happening at the moment where we're looking at a range of kind of priority use cases. So we saw the kind of meds reconciliation uh, type ones on there. So what we want to understand is from those those brief ones that we had around the drivers, why we want to do it, what the um, national guidance from CQC or NICE from NHS England, from the patient safety, is already existing. And then what, to try to build on that, say why it's an issue and what we might do um, with that. So the, this commission will outline in more detail what the current process is, what we see the future process being, and how we might intend to get there. Um, and the second part, of this, I said that was the last time, but this one is, the second part is, is to look at some of the capabilities we've talked about. So we said business capabilities, but actually when we've talked about information sharing, we've, said we've kind of split some of those up into kind of operational. So we've got people telling us they want to do e-rostering, want to do e-scheduling. Um, so how do we put some capabilities around that? 
sets around care planning and coordination. So create care plan, update care plan, delete care plan, things like that. Uh, and then down to record management type ones. So we've got a project going on at the moment. You've heard of GP Connect, uh, which acts as the GP record. Um, but actually, that's not the only one at the record level we want, we want to build up. We've got a view to do community record, mental health records, uh, in a kind of Care Connect service that, that, that's coming on. Um, but then individually to go down to some of those more granular levels, um, maybe within an organisation to say, get medications, get allergies, um, get diagnoses, and then how do, we, how do we use those individual capabilities to meet the use cases that we've already talked about. So when we talk about meds reconciliation, we're obviously going to need get medications, um, and how do someone use that to implement um, that scenario? And that's all I'm going to talk through, so I'll hand over to Indy for the last kind of call out. Yeah. There's no more slides. Perfect. So uh, just in terms of quick summary with the uh, minus two minutes on me. So I just thought it was useful just to do a quick tail off. So hopefully that was quite a lot of content that you we went through. Um, I'm trying to work out what you're saying, Victory. Two minutes. Oh, two minutes left. Oh, perfect. Um, so in terms of key takeaways, one, uh, this is very much got to be about a collaboration. Um, this has got to be about how do we work together in terms of uh, national and local organisations. Um, how do we secondly use the various levers and influences that we have across local CCIOs and national organisations as well. But also in terms of the work that we've outlined today, this is very much around this being at the start of the journey. So this is very much a call out to say we want to get your involvement in that in terms of what are the key priority clinical scenarios that we need to drive forward? Because that then allows us to really call out and be much more specific around what we need to be able to deliver. Uh, for me personally, the term interoperability is so vast and vague that actually you end up kind of getting lost in yourself. You know, we don't necessarily deliver interoperability. What we need to be trying to think about is what are the clinical scenarios and the clinical benefits that we're trying to deliver and let's focus upon those. So one of the key call outs very much for today is how do we or can we work with yourselves as an overall community to really get your feedback, your input into what are those priority areas that we need to focus on but in enough granularity that allows us to really start defining what the APIs are and what the standards are uh, that was underneath those and then also in terms of the lights around the design guides, around the um, the, uh, the use cases and around the business cases, again, to do the call out very much to work with yourselves on that. The other thing very much to reiterate is this has been done as a collaborative conjunction between national and local organisations. So this isn't local or this isn't national. This is about how do we put in the supporting services at a national level around being able to support local interoperability and also at the same time, how do we enable information sharing at a local level to be able to be available national, to be able to support national uh, purposes as well. So I really just wanted to kind of do that summary around collaboration, early input, and very much about how we do uh, national and local work together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's fine. So we have now well-deserved.